Oh, hello everyone for joining so far. Uh, let me see if I can get my face on the screen. Yes, here we are. Welcome, welcome to the uh, live stream before the ma match day. I'm um, really looking forward to see some Barcelona back on the TV. Um, we've missed it a lot over the summer um, and now we are back. So today we will have on the stream the writer of this book here on my left side. So, uh, so yeah, let's get into the conversation and uh, we'll go from there. All right, guys, let me see if I can get my guest on. Yes, there we are. Hi, Simon. How are we doing? Ooh, you there? Yeah. Mm. Ah, yes, I think you're back. Anyway, hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Um, yeah, I've got the book uh, on the screen as well. So let's uh, start off with some uh, introductions. And uh, yes, Simon, so, uh, well, let's get straight over to you. What, uh, introduce yourself a little bit um, and talk us through about some of your favorite football memories, because I always love hearing about those uh, on, the, on the stream. <laughs> Uh, my name is Simon Cooper, and I'm British, but like Marcel, I grew up largely in Holland, so I became a fan of football in Holland and began playing football there. And I arrived in the Netherlands in 1976 as a six-year-old, playing on the streets and then at a club. And so, of course, I fell in love with Dutch football and the football of Johan Cruyff, who, as you will know, is really the father of the modern Barcelona. And so my favorite memories are really all about the Dutch national team. I remember as an eight-year-old watching the World Cup final 1978. I, I distinctly and very clearly remember going to Johan Cruyff's first match back in Holland in 1981, but we couldn't get in because it was wow. sold out for the first <laughs> time in modern history. I cried. Then for the next years, followed Cruyff fanatically. And then in uh, 1988, I think the high point of Dutch football was beating West Germany in the European Championship semi-final. Yeah. But all those memories and having grown up in Holland, I see Barcelona really as a Dutch club. So that is how I wanted to write a book about this club. I think I'd been involved with it emotionally for 40 years and wanted to trace the story of the club from Kev's arrival as a player in 1973 until today, really. Awesome. Yeah, Cruyff is obviously the, the big link between, um, yeah, the Dutch football and, uh, and Barcelona. Uh, kind of the father of the um, yeah of this now successful club that is Barcelona, obviously. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, let's start to talk a little bit about your your new book. Uh, as I told you, it's on the screen, so it's called Barcelona Barça. The, um, the <laughs> I think inside story of the world's greatest football exactly, club. Exactly. Yes, yes. 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 Um, so tell and us a little bit. Can... Awesome. Uh, tell us a little bit about your new book and uh, why you decided to write this uh, book about uh, Barcelona. Visiting the club since 1992, and I've always been interested because of, you know, the most beautiful football, the Dutch tradition. And I think over time they started to regard me, people inside the club from all these visits, as a kind of socia, a kind of club member. And when I was there in 2019, writing an article for my newspaper, the Financial Times, I realized I'm opening not every door, but really a lot of doors for me. And right. I asked for they granted immediately, interviewed Ernesto Valverde, the then coach, and Bartomeu. And you know, I, I was there interviewing people behind the scenes as well, psychologists, and doctors, nutritionists, Masia coaches. And I thought, wow, because, you know, for a journalist in modern football, getting access is really difficult. Usually uh, they keep journalists on the outside. Yeah. You get a seat at the press conference. You get to listen to the coach telling all these self-justifying stories about why they <laughs> lost, blaming the referee, yeah, all course. this nonsense. Yeah. Maybe you get 12 minutes with a player. And Barcelona were giving me access. So I said to my contacts at the club, if I wrote a book, would you keep opening doors to me? And they said, and I have to give the club full credit that in these last two very difficult years when things were falling apart to some degree, yeah. they kept opening doors for me, they kept setting up interviews, and they never asked to censor the book, to see it in advance. And so I'm very grateful 
grateful for the club to allowing me to write this really from the inside. Amazing. So you, you got um, a lot of access to club, which is um, which is something that is very rare nowadays. With obviously with, you know, um, press is being uh, sometimes a little bit like as you mentioned about the answers that are sometimes very standardized, and you know we all heard it before, and and you know the the excuses or whatever you wanna wanna say um, about about that. And, um, well, you know, it's been a very move, moving summer for Barcelona this summer with um, uh, some uh, hectic, momentous moments. Uh, biggest one, obviously, being Lionel Messi leaving the club. Um, with, with some of the, uh, the inside information, um, what do you think is the real reason that um, Messi left? Obviously, we've been told by the club a lot of things, but is there anything that you can shed light on, on in terms of this uh, big departure in the club? I think that it's true the financial meltdown of and so they about 1.2 billion they're unable to offer him a contract even on much lower pay they can't even struggling as we know before tonight's game to players who came from nothing like memphis and eric garcia yeah so there is a financial crisis i think two things i would add is one is la porta he is hidden during his election campaign, it was, well, when I become president, Messi likes me, and so we'll have an asado together and Messi will sign. Laporte telling this very positive, optimistic story, kind of pretending that these problems would disappear magically, because yeah. Laporte is a guy who likes to tell positive stories. Yeah. And he must have known that even after he became president, they would still have this enormous, insoluble problem of how to keep all these players you can't afford. And the other thing is, from Messi's point of view, I think last summer, as Messi said, he genuinely wanted to leave. The club yeah. wasn't good enough. Messi's a winner. He wants to play for the best. And then I think a big shock for Messi is when he told his wife and his sons last September, August, September, look, I want to leave, join a different club. Yeah. They all burst out crying. And that was very for him. His sons didn't want to move to a new country, learn a new language, make new friends. And I think this summer... He well, look, my family want to stay. We like it here. This is the only life I've known. I'm 34 already. Maybe I should just accept that the end of my career is in this place, even if the team is not there anymore. And so he'd kind of reconciled himself to staying with Barcelona. And when he woke up on the morning of August 5th, he genuinely believed, I'm going to stay. Right. He's told by the club, no, we can't afford it. Now, you know, I've talked and other people have talked is Messi partly to blame for the meltdown of the club? I would say more exactly Father Jorge is to blame because in a family like that, the player's job is to play. So the family yeah. says, you just play, we'll take care of everything else. Right. And Jorge Messi thinks he's a you know, brilliant businessman. So Jorge Messi was always going to the club and saying, well, next summer my son might leave if you don't give him more money. And so Barcelona, of course, desperate to keep Messi. They trebled his salary between 2014 and 2020. And in the end, and I know a lot of Barca fans don't like hearing this, it became too much. Yeah. Uh, 125 million euros or so a season is not affordable for the club anymore, however much money Messi does bring in. And so in the end, I wouldn't say that Leo Messi broke the club, but I would say that Jorge Messi broke the club. And Leo probably didn't know much about it. He doesn't really know salary negotiations. He doesn't know about his evasion of taxes for which he and his father were. Wow. Because in that family, the player plays, the family takes care of the money. The others take care of the money. Wow. That, yeah, so, I mean, we, we don't get a lot of insight into these ne negotiations, but I do know that um, a lot of people outside of the club that are not part of uh, Barcelona, they see Messi's contract as part of the reason that, um, that the club went down, and, and a lot of uh, fans don't like to hear this. So, yeah, it, it is really sad to see. Um, and um, so who else from, obviously, this, this big contract, uh, who is, is responsible for the situation at Barcelona? Is there specific people or is it just a, you know, a, a coincidence of, of, of stuff that happened in the club? What is your insight into the downfall of, of Barcelona? Firstly, I think that when you're number one, and Barcelona was number one, let's say, from 2005 to 2015, more or less, for 10 years, you're number one. That's a really long time. Yeah. When you're number one, you stop thinking. You become lazy. 
So all the other big clubs, Bayern and Liverpool and the English FA, were visiting Barcelona, visiting La Masia, copying Barca play, copying La Masia. And you see that even England, which you know never produced Barcelona-style players no. in the past, has players like Jay Sancho, like Phil Foden, like Sacco. Barcelona players are coming out of English academies now because they all copied La Masia. Everyone in the world copied La Masia. The French now produce short players. You know, 10 years ago, it was all just giants. Yeah. So everyone copied Barcelona. Barcelona got lazy. And then I think the other thing that happened is all this money was coming in because you had this team from La Masia, relatively little, no transfer fees. And all this money was coming in because this team was winning everything. And then they get lazy with the money. And Bartomeu, I think, is heavily to blame. Now, I feel bad saying this because Bartomeu is a really nice man and he helped make my book possible. Wow. He agreed that the club would open the doors to me. He was always very friendly to me. Yeah. But I blame him strongly for the bad transfers. So they spent from 2014 to 2019 about a billion euros on transfers, more than any other club in football. And of course, mostly these transfers didn't work out. You know, if you spend more than 100 million for a player, like they did on Griezmann, Dembele, Coutinho, you really should be getting a guarantee of quality. And Tomeo screwed up in many ways on buying players yeah yeah so one of the questions that's coming through in the chat now is saying um when do you think uh things will get better financially or does it have to go first worse uh what do you think is the kind of predicted timeline for that financial struggle for the first few years i think it's going to be hard i mean because it's a, a member-owned club it's hard to find a run Ramovic, that doesn't really happen. Barca don't want that. that that's not going to happen at Barca. Yeah. And it's hard anyway for the financial fair play rules of football. So there's not a ship of money that's going to arrive. And then you still, even after Messi's departure, player salaries are nearly as high as, in, as revenues. So you're spending nearly every single euro that comes in on players. That's too much. That's above the La Liga rules. And so I think they still have to... And I think big other big clubs are looking at players like Pedri and Frankie and saying, you know, Barcelona trouble. Uh, how much would you? How much would you take for for Pedri? Yeah. So I think it's going to be very hard in the next few years. And even when I began writing the book in 2019, clubs were saying to me, look, after Messi, you see desert, you see darkness. One guy literally told me, and people said one possibility for Barca after Messi is we become like Manchester United after Alex Ferguson. Oh wow. We don't win anymore but we're still a big club high income respected around the world i think that's the, the happy outcome and the worst income is that you really sink for a few years mm. yeah it, it it's very hard to say what's what's going to happen um in the next few years i hope obviously that players like memphis who came in from from my country that they will be successful and can can win some trophies because i would love to see that but uh, it's really hard to say what's going to happen with the club in the next few years and um that brings me on to my uh, my next question um what do you think they uh, they should do uh, sort of in terms of your advice and what would you do if you were president of the of the club of barcelona thing to do and it's not Laporta's style but I would lower expectations I would say going to win La Liga or the Champions League probably in the next few seasons we don't have money to buy you know the next there is no next Messi anyway we will not replace Messi it's impossible yeah. there is no money to buy the next Ronaldinho the next Samuel Eto'o so be patient give the kids a chance and if we finish or sixth well that's the we're in yeah. let's not let finances get completely out of control and then become a kind of rangers or leeds united where you you just collapse for years let's try and avoid that yeah yeah i guess it's it's all about damage control right now and just try to do the best you can with um with the players you have and then um try and build on build on that and yeah, bring on the Lamaza, La Masia, uh kids back into the um, to the lineup, right? So uh, um, then talking a little bit about Kuman, with obviously you're you're brought up in in Dutch football. Um, can he win uh, prizes this season? Maybe even like a, a Copa del Rey. Um, what what is your 
kind of vision on the new season and who will take the limelight from from Messi this season? Who do you see as the player that will really step up? Always possible because a cup competition is a little bit of a lottery. You know, you have a couple of lucky play weaker teams and you're suddenly in the semifinals. So yes, the Copa del Rey, I think, is their best bet. Yeah. I mean, there will be another Messi. I mean, in the book, I argue that Messi is so far ahead of the best players of our time that he is beyond comparison. So I was struck into both Kylian Mbappe and Frankie de Jong and many of you know Kylian Mbappe Frankie de Jong they're in the top 10 20 players in the world these yeah. are incredible players and they both said Messi is much better than us and will always be so Mbappe is seen as the best player of his generation but he said you cannot compare me to Messi or to Ronaldo these guys are just so far above they've broken all the laws of statistics Barcelona is not going to get another Messi probably in our lifetimes there isn't another Messi no. who can become the main man I mean obviously you have to look at Pedri right. I mean he's had a brutal summer he's played two tournaments I don't know how any survives that but no. Pedri has claimed to being the best player of his generation and he could become the next movie. you know if I look at the bar a team and say who world-class players in this team I, I can't see really beyond Pedri and uh, Frankie mm. yeah it's Frankie and Pedri I think will be uh, so important in the rebuild of, of Barcelona um, with st still being fairly young and especially Pedri they can be um, very uh, very detrimental in that a um, couple questions from the I, I obviously believe well, just one thing, I obviously believe that Busquets and Piquet have been world class players, but I don't think they can continue to be. No, it's true. Awful. They'll 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 probably have to step down a little bit on minutes this season. Um, um, and uh, yeah, there's a couple of uh, questions from the chat. So, um, what about Ricky Puj? Um, what's your thoughts on his situation, Moriba's situation, and? Uh, Mateos Fernandez as well. Uh, obviously, he costs Barca a lot of money. What What is some of your thoughts on those situations of players? I mean, Ricky Puig is obviously a, a gifted player, but he's been rejected, I think, by two or three Barcelona coaches. Yeah, not being ready for the first team, and I I don't think they're all wrong. Mm. I mean, to be a kind of number ten at Barca standards required are extraordinary and you already have midfield playmakers in Frankie and Pedri who I think are ahead of him. I don't really see a future for Puig at Barca. Moriba, a different story. I think also a young player, Barca, I mean, historically, if you were in the Barca first team or near it, you wanted to stay. You didn't want to go anywhere else. Now a player like that is being told by his agent, by other clubs, you know, there are better places to go is where you can play with better players, earn more money. So I think that's one of the things that might be pulling us away, which never happened in the past in no. Barca. Yeah. And the last, so you, you asked me about Puig, uh, Puig Mori, uh, Moriba, and you asked me about, sorry. Mateus Fernandez, who was like one of those. Mateus Fernandez, so they sent, they sent him an email. So Fernandez, they think that was another of these very weird purchases. Yeah. Million euros for a reserve at Palmeiras, big mistake. Yeah. He played 17 minutes for the first team last year in a game at Kiev that they'd already won 4-0. So they obviously want to get rid of him. They sent him an email saying, well, we have terminated your contract. I don't know if that's legal because otherwise clubs would do that all the time to any player they didn't want. They'd say, we've sent you an email, your contract has ended. I, and so he's fighting that in court and he might well win. Oh, wow. Because they They are doing everything they can to stop paying his salary. That's crazy. Um, I hope, uh, well... For the club, I hope Barcelona win, but uh, Mateus Fernandez got a, a fighting chance of getting some money out of it, obviously. Um, and um, so, obviously, with, with, your, with your book, you publish often unknown details about Barca. So, what are some of the tricks that you have of getting these uh, these kind of classified, uh, well, class, you know, interesting uh, details about Barcelona? What what is uh, tricks of the trade that you have? The main way I worked in this book is that, yes, you want to interview the players and the managers and the presidents, which I did. You know, I also had nearly 30 years of interviews in my notebooks with people like Neymar and Kev and Piquet. So that was good. But 
what I did, which helps you get that background, is I interviewed the people nobody ever interviews at the club. The nutritionists, the psychologists, the assistant coaches, the youth coaches, the ex-presidents, the doctors, the business executives, all these people who sort of, many of them had never been interviewed before, and they're very happy to talk to me about their work, or uh, Arthur, who drove Messi to his first training session. Oh, wow, yeah. The, you know, the psychologist who helped Andres Iniesta when he was having a very hard time mentally, 2009-10. And so these people, who I wasn't allowed to quote most of them, so I wasn't allowed to mention their names. The club arranged usually these interviews, but I wasn't allowed to mention who I got information from, but I could use the information. And then you get often much more real and interesting and deep in than if you're sitting down with a player. That's sometimes good, you know, sometimes yeah. like when I think it was very interesting. But the player, of course, is going to be more careful. And often the psychologist who's worked at the club for maybe 20 years has seen a lot more than any player has. Of course, yeah. Um, they they talk when the player is having a difficult time, so they they usually have um, yeah some uh, probably interesting uh, anecdotes, and um, and that's usually what you what you get left out of um, when you when you are uh, just talking to the players, right? Um, and uh, it, so one of the newest talents that is being uh, having a little bit of a hard time is Colado. What what is your uh, opinion on his situation uh, should he go out on loan to get some experience first team football well, i'd say that if you're a masia player this is the best time to be at barca and to stay ah right so you know it, i wrote it about the masia in 2009 when they were the best in the world and again in 2019 and in 2019 before the club melted down the masia coaches were very frustrated they said uh Produce these players and they can't get into the first team. They get sent away. They don't even get a chance to fail in the first team. Wow, yeah. And suddenly, Barca has to use the Masia. You know, more, more players are going to leave, like Busquets and Piquet will leave in the next year or so. They won't be replaced. And if you're a kid in the Masia, this is your chance. And so I would advise everyone to stay. And, you know, in a few <laughs> months' time, you could be playing in the first team, like happened to Mingueza last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's actually true. Well, I would like to uh, get your opinion on on the upcoming game against Real Sociedad. Um, I've just looked at the lineup. Actually, both Pedri and De Jong are starting, which I didn't uh, didn't expect. Memphis Depay is starting. Um, Serginho Dest, Alba, and Busquets, Piquet, Garcia. So, what is your uh, expectations of the game today? Uh, do you think Barcelona can get a win and, and maybe a prediction from yourself as well? No, even with a much weaker side, I think they will win. But look, El Sociedad at home, that's you have to do. Even if you're going to finish number six, you should be beating Sociedad at home. Yeah. It, over 38 matches, should we expect Barca to be number one? I, I really don't think so. I struggle to see that happening. Barca's advantage is at Atletico. Oh, wait, wait. Hank, uh, can you mute yourself for two seconds, please? <laughs> Barca's advantage is that Atletico and Real Madrid have problems of their own, also will be weaker. And one Barca guy told me, you don't have to be in the world, you just have to be the best in Spain. And it's True. easier now to be the best in Spain than two or three years ago. Uh, Simon, can you see um, um, uh, Hank's uh, view? He just joined the chat and uh, he's live in the, uh, in the camp now. Can you see him? And I saw his camera. Hi, Hank. How many people are going to be in the company tonight? I haven't followed how many they're letting in. I think it's um I think it's 20,000 but yeah it's um it's really uh, cool to see um all this all these fans in the stadium. <laughs> I think with a crowd uh, is fantastic yeah. Uh, I went to Valencia Getafe two nights ago the first game of the Spanish season and there were also about 20,000 people it was lovely to be in a stadium I learned a lot of Spanish swear words it was very helpful. <laughs> yeah I'm sure Oh, uh, well. Um, so what's your, your prediction then? 3-0 Barcelona, 2-1, 3-1? 3-1, yeah. 
My prediction. So don't believe us. Two, two, one. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, you, you're cutting out sometimes. Is it? Is wrong. So please don't attach too much value to them. Okay. <laughs> Well, Simon, um, I think I'm going to wrap, wrap up the interview here. I'm going to try and get some impressions from the stadium from Hank. Uh, but I'd like to thank you very much for coming on the stream. Any last words that you have um, before uh, yeah, getting ready to watch the game, I suppose? Read my book. It's, yeah. It really takes you through 50 years of Barca from Krev to Messi. And it's so much about these two incredible people. And have a fantastic season. I'll, I'm damn for you Lee. i'm really hoping it will work out amazing thank you so much for joining and uh yeah i'm gonna try and get uh hank on now and uh simon see you on uh on the twitter timeline thank you so much <laughs> thanks guys bye 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 right um hank let me see if i can hi, get hi <laughs> yeah i can hear you i'm just trying to get uh, my stream <laughs> this is great yeah <laughs> you're live from the stadium how are we doing i'm actually emotional ah uh, yeah how, co how yes. come well you know this year i'm a barcelona fan for 50 years since 1971 when uh, rinus michel joined barca as their coach and since 2003 i am a social and this is my eighth match in Camp Nou. And uh, it's the first match I see without Messi. I think that's a lot of emotion. Yeah, of course. It's, we are all as a fan allowed to see since one and a half year. Wow. And so uh, actually the players of Barca are just entering the pitch. So that's why you hear Eye of the Tiger. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. It's, uh, to so, um, so how is the stadium? Is there uh, any messy chanting going on, or is is what is the kind of vibe that you're uh, getting from the crowd? Uh, there's not yet uh, any messy chanting going on. I heard we will all do that in the tenth minute. Awesome. And uh, if I look at all the shirts here in the stadium, uh, I think fifty percent of it is number ten messy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see some Henry, I see some De Jong, I see some Piquet, but most of it, and I see a lot of new Memphis shirts, I must admit, but oh. half of it is number 10 Messi. And, well, there are actually a lot of Dutch people who are on holiday here in the stadium. I guess maybe one of the three fans in the stadium is his Dutch tonight. Wow. Um, well, they all regret Messi is gone. Yeah. But uh, they're also very proud on, um, let's say, our Dutch heritage at Barca. I, uh, before the match, I went into the Barca Museum, went to the Cruyff Corner. Um, well, you can't see Barca uh, without him. So if you look at my shirt, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. that's the uh, Barca El Flaco shirt. I, I already received a lot of or, uh, offers to change it for a new Barca one. But I won't. <laughs> oh, wow. Amazing. And um, um, so in the stadium, uh, so the players are warming up now. Um, uh, yeah. What, what is your thoughts on the game ahead against Real Sociedad? What, what do you think is Barcelona's chances? Well, uh, there are a few surprises, I guess. Eric Garcia playing and not Araujo. Yeah. That's surprise number one. And I hope Demir would play instead of Braithwaite. But uh, I, I can imagine uh, this front three, and we can always have uh, uh, Demir as, an, as a joker later on. Right. And of course, um, uh, Eric Garcia is an excellent passer. Um, so, and, and he and Pe Pedri, they are in the rhythm. Eh? They, they played all summer, so it's not their first real match. It's one of uh, <laughs> a lot of matches. Maybe <laughs> that's why Koeman uh, chose for... Uh, Garcia, I don't know. Um, but uh, the expectations are there. And why? Um, it's maybe what uh, Johan Cruyff would say now. For 21 years, we were dependent on Messi. Yeah. Sporting and financially. And now we have to re really rebuild Barca again. We have no Lionel Messi again. So um, 
it's time for us to uh, build up a new Barsha. There are plenty of talents. Um, I have a lot of expectations uh, about Memphis. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. So let's, start today. let's start today with rebuilding and enjoy our new Barsha. And maybe, maybe Messi will be back in two years to, to uh, finalize his career for one season. That's what I hope, but we don't buy anything for that now. No, it's true. And um, have, have you uh, actually read the book from, uh, from uh, Simon Kuyper, my previous guest, and uh, any, yes, of, any, any feedback that you want to give on it? Because, um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to obviously do my best to promote the book. <laughs> well, you know, Simon is uh, not only a, a football journalist, but he's also a financial journalist. Um, he works for the Financial Times. Um, so I uh, really was surprised how much access he got to all those uh, figures, etc. Yeah. And I think it's uh, it's a new angle at everything that is written about uh, uh, Barcelona. As Simon also wrote a book like uh, Soccernomics, which was also a big hit uh, worldwide. Um, well, and he got. Uh, even Gary Lineker said it's Meske and Book. So <laughs> I don't know if he read it. Or yeah. just got paid for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw, I saw that quote. It's a good quote to get on the cover of your book from Gary Lineker. Yeah. yeah. I, I read some of his books, and he's uh, well. He's for me. He's also a bit Dutch, yeah. and uh, he wrote for Dutch uh, 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 newspapers like the Volkskrant and uh, NSA as well. I think it's uh, an, a, a real. It adds something to Barca's history of uh, literature. Yeah, very true. I, uh, I, uh, I'm really gonna, um, gonna have to read the book because uh, I've only. You have it in two days. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I hope so actually, because um, I, I need to, I need to go online and see if I can get it. Um, but any, uh, any, anything you want to show in the stadium? Uh, maybe we can get some more impressions on on how it looks like everywhere. Well, you know what was nice? I was, I had some extra time, and so I was walking around the stadium. And then I came at the entrance without noticing first where all these Barca players are arriving in their expensive cars. <laughs> so uh, I saw uh, Memphis in a Bentley, Jordi Alba in, in a Land Rover. Wow. I, I had to back down because he just had his driver's license. <laughs> and um, and uh, I should have seen Griezmann in an expensive uh, car, but uh, that was nice because uh, everybody was, uh, there was a, a big crowd over there all looking at these players in the big cars. And all these players, they were coming from the other side. So they had to pass, had to go uh, half a kilometer past the entrance and then turn. And then came Dest he did, and he immediately turned across the road, <laughs> didn't drive one kilometer, but he, and everybody was laughing and cheering at him. <laughs> so that, that was a very nice moment tonight. Awesome. So, so the players are all here, ready for the new season. And um, can I get your uh, your predictions for today's game, uh, Henk? Yes, I think we beat uh, Real Sociedad with three to one. It will be one 0 at the break. It will be two goals of Memphis and a Braithwaite goal. Awesome! Ah, Braithwaite is going to score, yeah. <laughs> Yes, you know, it's such a, a nice guy and uh, we all talk about uh, Piquet now who was uh, uh, offering his salary and uh, all the other uh, uh, guys who have such a big heart for uh, Barca, but we sometimes forget Braithwaite and maybe because it's not a player who has a technical ability which is on the level of Barca, but his heart sure is. This is true, this is true. Um, can you um, maybe uh, twist your camera and show the viewers? Look at yeah, let's have a look. Oh, wow. The Come Now is really a beautiful stadium. I really, uh, really love it. Yeah. Can you see it now? Yeah, yeah, I can see it. It's a beautiful view inside the stadium. <laughs> wow. Well, Thank you. I, I see uh, Henk Larsen who is uh, uh, doing a warming up with NATO. Uh, awesome. <laughs> so, so Henk, uh, I don't want to keep you longer. I'm sure there's a lot of excitement in the stadium. Uh, thank you so much for joining the stream today. Any last words you want to um, you want to say to the to the stream and for people who are going to watch this back as a yeah. video? 
I want to say I, I know uh, there are a lot of emotions, a lot of things have happened, and uh, we might want to blame a lot of people. Um, be polite, do not abuse, do not hate. Um, the football needs you. The football players need you. And you may have an opinion and you may dislike someone or not be someone's fan, fan but don't abuse, do not hate. This is such a beautiful game. Act positive and instead of hating, be positive about, uh, about uh, the guy you're the fan of, of the club you're the fan of. It's yeah. much more easy and it will make everything among us also on social media, so much uh, nicer and happier. And I want to thank you for being the most positive person uh, on uh, on Twitter always. <laughs> and uh, keep it up, uh, Marcel, and we will always back you up. Amazing. Thank you so much, Hank. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close the stream, but uh, enjoy the game. And, uh, yeah, I'll be watching it on TV, and uh, maybe I'll see you on the big screen later. <laughs> I'll do some tweets uh, and pictures as well. <laughs> awesome. I will keep an eye out for that. See you later, Hank. Thank you so okay. much. Bye-bye, Michelle. All the best. All the best. Good All luck. the best. Thank you. <laughs> wow, guys. Um... Yeah, as I said, I want to thank my guest on today's stream. Um, I had, uh, obviously, with me the writer of this beautiful book, uh, Simon Cooper. Uh, sorry for some of the connectivity issues, uh, but I hope you got most of his stories. Really got some really good insights, and I hope you uh, will go out and, and have a look at his new book, which is Barca, the inside story of the world's greatest football club. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm definitely gonna gonna read up on some of the knowledge and back uh, backstory of the of the club. Um, I'm gonna play everyone out on the um, Barcelona anthem, and uh, yeah, let's watch some beautiful football. Ciao, ciao, guys.